Secretary Chow is the first Asian American woman to serve in a president's cabinet. From 2017 to 2021, she served as Secretary of Transportation. Previously, from 2001 to 2009, she served as Secretary of Labor, during which time she participated in the U.S.-China Strategic Economic Dialogue and led the U.S. delegation to the closing ceremony of the Beijing Olympics. Secretary Chow has also served in various other positions in public, private, and nonprofit sectors, including as President and CEO of United Way, Director of the Peace Corps, Chair of the Federal Maritime Commission, Deputy Transportation Secretary, and as a banker with Citibank and Bank of America. Like tonight's honoree, Secretary Chow is also an immigrant to this nation, arriving in the U.S. from Taipei at age eight, before earning her BA from Mount Holyoke College and her MBA from Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Chow. Thank you, Secretary Liu, for that overly generous introduction. It's wonderful to be here with all of you in person as well. Thank you for inviting me to share a few thoughts this evening in advance of my introduction of our honoree. For 55 years, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations has played an important role in encouraging better understanding between the people of China and the United States. You have promoted open dialogue between the two countries with the goal of enhancing mutual understanding and promoting a stable, productive relationship. Today, the U.S.-China relationship is in one of its most sensitive and challenging stages since 1979. In the U.S., liberal and conservative policymakers from both political parties are unusually aligned in criticizing China. In addition, most reporting on China in the American media are negative or suspicious in tone. Against this backdrop, I would like to urge and encourage all of us to remain vigilant. We must ensure that the difficult relations between our two countries do not turn into anti-Asian hate or negative sentiments or violence that harm the Asian American community, whose contribution to America you have heard so much about. And that's why I'm so glad to see the formation of new organizations established to give voice to Asian American concerns. And I want to, in particular, call out Mr. Peng Zhao, who has participated in the founding of the Asian American Foundation. <laughs> American ideals are what draws the rest of the world to our shores. And it's incumbent upon all of us to ensure that those dreams and ideals remain. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Ming She, of whom you've heard so much about. He exemplifies all the traits that have enabled Americans of Chinese ancestry to contribute so much to our country. As you know and have heard, Ming She is renowned as a gifted innovator, highly successful entrepreneur, and a very generous philanthropist. You may not know the rest of his journey, so let me share that with you. Ming came to the United States with the hope of contributing to society by building upon the achievements of his father, a professor and scientist at the China Electric Power Research Institute. Ming started out in 1981 as a junior transfer student to the University of Southern California from the Southern China Science and Technology University. He earned a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering and a Master's Degree from USC. But like so many immigrants, his new life in America brought many personal and professional challenges, including a significant language barrier and major cultural adjustments. And he also had to work multiple jobs 
to pay for his tuition and living expenses. But he persevered and thrived on these challenges, which helped to make him into the success that he is today. Because Ming founded Kojin Systems, which under his direction became a global leader in providing biometric identification systems for law enforcement and government agencies, our government. He went on to found Fugent Genetics, which became a leading cancer genetic diagnostic company. And it goes without saying that both these companies have made significant contributions to our country in the security and healthcare sectors. Now, always looking for new ways to make a difference, Ming has recently overseen Fugent's rapid pivot to creating testing and vaccination solutions to help combat COVID-19, and he's also worked with CDC to track and disseminate information to combat variants as well. Ming's achievements in science and engineering have not gone unnoticed by leaders in the industry. He was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Engineers, one of the highest professional honors in engineering. He was also named a fellow of the National Academy of Investors for his innovation and biometric identification technology. And during his service at the National Academy of Engineering, Ming has worked to promote a global collaboration between the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, the China National Academy of Engineering, and the UK Royal Academy of Engineering. Ming was also the recipient of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, and his personal story has been archived at the National Museum of American History. As his innovations attest, Ming is passionate about improving the lives of others, not only by creating new solutions and opportunity, but through his extensive philanthropic efforts as well. He has donated more than $100 million to support research, educational, and medical institutions that promote scientific advancement, fight cancer, and support global engineering collaborations. His generosity, along with Dr. Henry Kissinger and Rupert Murdoch, enabled the Nixon Library's China Pavilion, Pavilion to tell the story of the week that changed the world. For all these achievements, especially his seminal contributions to science, engineering, healthcare, and philanthropy, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's honoree, Ming Shi. So many thanks to Secretary Chao for such a very kind and very generous word and the introduction. Dear estimate uh, the guests, Ambassador Qing Gang and Ambassador Geng Shuang, Secretary Jack Lu and uh, Governor Gary Locke, dear all the colleagues and the friends at the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations. To all the sponsors, friends, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm very humbled and honored to be here today to receive this award. And I would like 
thanks the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations for their recognition and support. I want to also thank Dr. Kissinger for his heartwarming messages as an immigrant and as a colleague. I was born in Xinjiang, a northwestern industrial city in China. My father was a research scientist, and my mother was a high school literature teacher. I had very happy and cheerful childhood until the beginning of the Cultural Revolution in 19. 66. Like most intellectuals during the Cultural Revolution, our family was sent to a remote village to do farm work in Panjing County, Liaoning Province, for so called re education in 1970. In the village, there was no paved road, no electricity, no fresh water, and even worse, there was no school. Effectively, my formal education ended before I started middle school. Instead, I had to do had many work of labor in the fields, pulling the weeds, plow the fields, shoveling the manure from sunrise to sunset in a tough environment. However, I was lucky. Since my parents were both educators, they ensured I was getting an education from whatever resources they had. During the off season, my father created handwritten textbooks and taught me physics, mathematics, and electronics in an application manner. I became his assistant in pulling the wires climb the poles, and setting up the transformers. Through his ingenuity, we successfully brought electricity into our village. My father inspired me in interest in engineering, science, and more importantly, my drive for community service through solving problems. I dreamed that one day I could study in a university and become an electrical engineer like my father. But as a farmer in a rural village, all that seems like a very remote fantasy. I had a, a vivid memory on a special day in 1971. I was working in the field and I heard an announcement from a loudspeaker that Dr. Kissinger made a historical trip to Beijing and arranged President Nixon's first visit to China. I didn't know how that visit could impact my personal life during that time, but I sensed something very important, change would be happening in China. I wish Dr. Kissinger's tonight's video could deliver them in advance 50 years ago, which would be a powerful recommendation uh, for my reference for college admissions. <laughs> yeah. 
probably now is not uh, for the case in the U.S. now. <laughs> so that trip begins the normalization of China and the U.S. relationships and accelerate China's reform. With the subsequent establishment for the National College Entrance Exam System in China, I became one of the first group of students to enter university since the Cultural Revolution. So we call that now class of 1977. Three years later, I was able to transfer to the renowned University of Southern California and begin my American dream. I was very grateful that the stable and the cooperative U.S.-China relations allow me to change from a, a field farmer to a member of the National Academy of Engineering and Science. I am a beneficiary of these relationships. To prepare tonight's gala, and I had a, a talk with Dr. Kissinger. I told him about this story. And he was very calm and did not answer immediately. And he told me, me, I know many farmers in the 70s. So I paused a little bit and started to count. The current foreign minister, Wang Yi, was a farmer. The West Premier, Liu He, was a farmer. Premier Li Keqiang was a farmer. And the President Xi Jinping was also a farmer. To extend more, and the President Jimmy Carter was also a farmer. <laughs> but, there is a fundamental difference in the definition of a farmer. In China, farmer, you had to really work. <laughs> so, yes, since the ice-breaking bilateral relationship in 1971, China and U.S. has worked together and brought a tangible benefit, not only to myself, but hundreds of millions of people in both countries and the world through globalization. I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity and the success that my immigration from China to U.S. has afforded me. But, uh, I will never forget my origin and remain grateful to China for insulating my science and engineering enlightenment. To me, the best way to honor and give back to the country that raised me and also the country that provide me with the opportunity to thrive is through supporting the education and the preservation of heritage. I'm very much looking forward to continue to work with the National Committee of U.S. and China Relations to achieve our missions. I would like also at this time, using this opportunity to thank Secretary Chow again. She has dedicated her life for public service and also has generously mentored me for many years and introduced me to this committee and to the Nixon Foundation and also to the Committee of 100. And today we also have the, you know, I didn't mention the government Gary Locke, it is uh, Committee 100's current chairman. I don't know where is the 
the, our chairman. So. So the, I almost lost the, not only the, our governor and chairman, I lost the, my sentence here. <laughs> so for all these organizations I involved, is all in the one common goal, is promoting open dialogue between the two countries. And with the goal of enhancing mutual understandings and promoting the stable, constructive relationships between our two countries. So after this gala, we have a lot of work to do. So many thanks for this uh, a great honor and many thanks for all your support tonight. Thank you very much.